You know, a lot of people think that uh, we are fanatics about liberty. And they're right. We are fanatics about liberty. Liberty is at the root of everything. Without liberty, you can't have morality. Because if you're not free to make choices, then how can you be moral or immoral? Without liberty, you can't have peace. Because how can you have peace when some people are forcing other people to do their will? Without liberty, without liberty, you can't even have ambition. Because if you're not free to follow your own dreams, if you must follow the dreams of Al Gore or George Bush or Bill Clinton or the Congress or whoever it may be, then how in the world can you be ambitious? So we are fanatical about liberty. And right now, it doesn't seem like the prospects for liberty are very good. But I hope in the next few minutes to convince you that they might be better than maybe we thought. But I think we need to begin by recognizing what we're up against. It isn't all that simple. I know so many times in the last six years since I've been involved in the Libertarian Party, somebody has come up to me and said, you know what we have to do? And if we would just do this, then we would make this enormous breakthrough. But it isn't that simple. We have a two-party system in America, and it's a two-party system not by popular opinion. It hasn't evolved out of the marketplace. It is there because the Republicans and Democrats have passed laws to make it a two-party system. You all know about the ballot access laws. They are oppressive in many states in this country. In Oklahoma, for instance, it takes about $100,000 to get libertarians on the ballot in Oklahoma. Republicans and Democrats go down to the city hall give them a filing fee of $100 or so, sign a few papers, and they're on the ballot. And in many states of the country, it is that way. It's that way at the national level. The Republicans and Democrats subsidize their own campaigns with our money. They even pay for their own conventions with our money. And then they put limits on the money that we can raise so that we can't compete with them on an even keel in any possible way. There are all sorts of barriers that are put in the way. Not only that, we look around us and we see that the press is hostile to the idea of liberty. Most people in the press are for big government. Most people think that the solutions to anything, whether it's health care problems, education, whatever it is, has got to be more, more government. And it's not just the press. It's academia. It's the, the whole education system. It is the historians. Even the entertainers, for heaven's sake, come out on the side of big government. But you know something? They have to have all of this on their side because they don't have what we have. We have the greatest advantage in the world on our side if we would just recognize it and use it. And that advantage is human nature. We are on the side of nature. They are trying to do something artificial. They are trying to do something that is unnatural and as a result of that, it takes these enormous resources to get them where they are today. And they've gotten a long way. They've gotten a tremendous way. They've gotten to the point where it just seems unstoppable, where it's inevitable that government's going to get bigger and bigger. After all, we elect a Democratic president, and government gets bigger. We elect a Republican president, and government gets bigger. A Republican or Democratic Congress, and government gets bigger. They make a tax cut, and government gets bigger. They tell us they've balanced the budget, and government gets bigger. They reform welfare, and government gets bigger. They pass a bill to phase out farm subsidies completely, and government gets bigger. And they make tough budget cuts, and government gets bigger. Whatever they do, government gets bigger. And it can seem like this is inevitable, and it's going to go on forever. Well, you know something? I was born in 1933. I was 12 years old when the Cold War started. So I lived through that Cold War for almost 45 years. And it was inevitable that that Cold War was going to go on for the rest of my life. The idea that the Berlin Wall would ever come down, that anything of that sort could ever happen, just seemed so incomprehensible. And if you'd asked me in 1986 or 1987, I could have given you 20 reasons that the Cold War would go on for the rest of our lives. As logical and plausible and inevitable as it seemed. And then one day, for reasons I still don't fathom, 
the Hungarian government decided to lift the gates at the border and let the East German tourists out of Hungary and into Austria. And within a period of three or four months, the Berlin Wall came down. And within another year, the Soviet Union collapsed. And the Cold War was over. CIA had no premonition that this was going to happen. <laughs> I'm not even sure they know to this day. That <laughs> Well, actually, there's a good reason that they're not paying attention to that. They're too busy rooting out evil in all parts of the world now. So they don't have time to pay attention to that. But the, my point is that we should not give up just because it seems implausible. Because I come back again to the fact that we have the one advantage that they do not have. And this advantage trumps everything. We have human nature on our side, and human nature says that the desire to be free, to control one's own life, is as strong as the desire to live, as strong as the desire to procreate. We all have that built-in instinct to live. It doesn't matter how bad life gets, we fight to stay alive until it becomes so unbearable that death seems a better option. But that happens so seldom to so few people. We all have the desire to procreate, which reflects itself in the sexual urge. But just as strong is the desire to live one's own life the way you want to live it. You know, in all the people I've met throughout my life, the thousands, the tens of thousands of people that I have met, I've met people who have been married and divorced five times. I've met people who have failed in business three or four times. I've met people who have gone through bankruptcy. And yet I have never met a single soul who believed that Bill Clinton could run his life better than he can run it himself. <laughs> I've never met anyone who thinks that he ought to turn his life over to George Bush, because that George Bush certainly knows how to run things. He'd know how to make my decisions. Oh, sure, people say, what should I do about this? People come and ask you for advice. They say, what? I don't know what to do. What should I do? But you notice, they never take your advice. <laughs> They just want you to tell them what they've already decided to do. And even if they are going to take somebody else's advice, they still want to decide for themselves whose advice they want to take. Now, this may seem like a trivial matter, but it's at the heart of everything. No one wants somebody else running his life. Everybody wants to be free. And I can tell you that out there in America today, there are tens of millions of people who simply want to be left alone. If we could just find them and talk to them and inspire them. But of course, there's this tremendous apathy that exists. Well, apathy just means that other people are more interested in their lives than they are in yours. <laughs> That's all that it is. The fact of the matter is, that we have to hitch our wagon to other people's stars and not expect them to come and pay attention to us. I don't believe that, the, as so many people do, that the American people ever chose security over liberty. How many times have you heard that expression? Well, we can't win. The American people have chosen security over liberty. Maybe you don't get around in the same circles I do, but I must have heard that 30, 40 times in the last several years. The fact is the American people have never made such a choice. When were they ever given such a choice? You mean to say because they chose Bush over Clinton or Clinton over Dole or something like that, that they chose security over liberty? The only time they were ever given any kind of a choice was when Ronald Reagan ran against Jimmy Carter. And it wasn't that Ronald Reagan was promoting freedom so much, but his enemies made him look like he was. Oh, this guy wants to do with, away with Social Security. Can you imagine? He'd want to repeal the minimum wage. He's going to dismantle the welfare state and so on. All these horrible things are going to happen. So the American people voted him in in a landslide. <laughs> Too bad he didn't live up to the image of his enemies. <laughs> and government just got bigger <laughs> and bigger. Two-thirds it grew in the eight years of the Reagan administration. But the point is, 
that if anybody was making a conscious choice in 1980, it certainly seemed like they were choosing liberty over security. You know, I saw this when I was campaigning. I would appear on, as Bill pointed out, talk show after talk show after talk show on radio and television. But I began to realize at some point that almost everybody that I was talking to, whether it was the host or the listeners or whoever it was, had already made up his mind. And I wasn't going to change anybody's mind. The mere fact that they were tuned into a political show meant that they were interested in politics, and people who were interested in politics already have formed their opinions. Doesn't mean that it wasn't worthwhile to do it, but it means that what you're trying to do is to not convert somebody overnight to your point of view, but to move him a few feet from where he is now. If he's a dyed-in-the-wool socialist, then make him doubt socialism in some small way. If he's a Democrat who thinks the welfare state is great, well then give him some doubts about that and make him realize that he can't have that welfare state and still keep his civil liberties. And if he's a Republican, then make him realize that the Republican Party isn't doing anything for whatever it was he joined the Republican Party for. Whatever it may be, move him a step further in our direction. But every once in a while, I got the opportunity to appear on a non-political show of some kind, a sports show or uh, a music show or one of these morning drive time comedy shows where they never talk politics. And by definition, they don't want people like me on the show. But every once in a while, I was able to get on one of those shows. And it was amazing, the response that I got. People's minds were wide open. You know, out there in America, the biggest block of eligible voters is not the Republicans or the Democrats. It's not the liberals or the conservatives. It's the people who don't vote at all. There are 100 million people out there who could go to the polls and vote for somebody and don't bother to do so. And they may have all kinds of different reasons for it, but at the heart of it all, I'm sure, is the fact that they know it isn't going to make any difference in their lives. They know that, first of all, one vote isn't going to change the election, but even if it could, even if they could get somebody elected, what difference would it make? Nothing's going to change. They've seen Republicans come and go, Democrats come and go, the parties change, all this changes and changes, but nothing ever changes that's of any significance. And so they focus on the things that are really important in life, their own families their own lives, their jobs, the places where they can make a difference. And there is no reason for them to be interested in us. But their minds are wide open because they want to be free just as much as we do. So when I was on these shows, these people were very receptive. Let me give you an example. There's a couple of guys who have a morning comedy show called uh, their uh, John Boy and Billy from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. A couple of good old boys. And they're uh, syndicated all across the country. John, Boy, and Billy. And they never talk politics on the show, apparently. But it seems that every once in a while, one of them will say, well, what do you expect from politicians? Or something like that. Or, geez, that's the government for you. Or something of this sort. And apparently, somebody called in one day and said, you know, you guys sound like libertarians. And one of them said, what's a libertarian? Uh, I haven't been to the library in years. Uh, <laughs> and by one way or another, I wound up on the show for 10 minutes. And so it starts out, John Boy says, all right, tell us, Harry Brown, what's a libertarian? So never having been asked that question before in my life, <laughs> I thought for a few, few minutes and then recited the same old spiel. You know, well, we libertarians believe you should be able to live your life the way you want to live it, not the way George Bush or Al Gore thinks is best for you. We think you ought to be able to raise your children by your values, not the values of some bureaucrats who are trying to create a brave new world. We think you ought to be able to keep every dollar you earn. You're the one who gets up every day and goes to work and puts in all those hours. You should be able to keep every dollar you make and spend it, save it, give it away as you see fit. And at that point, Billy interrupts me and says, no more phone calls, please. We have ourselves a winner. <laughs> 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 
So we went on. He, they asked the two or three more questions, and I was gone. But over the next few days, I get these emails from libertarians all over the country who were listening to the show saying, wow, you should have heard the show after you left. People were calling in and saying, who was that masked man? Uh, <laughs> What was he talking about? What did he call himself? Uh, I, you know, are you sure this guy was a politician and so on? And, and, and there was all this enthusiasm. Now, please don't get me wrong. I don't think these people ran out and registered and voted libertarian or anything of the sort. You need more than one five minute appearance. You need a great deal of repetition so that people begin to feel that there really is some substance to all this, that this isn't just one person who happens to believe this and happen to be on this show. But the point is that these minds were wide open to what we have to sell. Because we are the only people in politics offering to let people run their own lives and make their own decisions. And this is so important. This is so important to people, just as it is to you. Maybe you put it in philosophical terms. Maybe you put it in terms of natural rights. Maybe you put it in terms of Ludwig von Mises. And they don't. They just put it in terms of paying the mortgage and raising their kids properly and so on. But it is exactly the same thing. We are fighting for the same things that they are. What we have to do, as I said, is to hitch our wagon to their star, to talk to them in their terms. This is the difference it will make in your life. Not, I have a right to keep and bear arms. I have a right to this, I have a right to that. Nobody cares about my rights. They care about their own lives.